All right, let's go to the book of Job. We are in the 27th chapter. I'm going to need you to get Job 27, Romans chapter 1, and Psalm 146, all by way of introduction. I know, right? <laughs> Let me try it again. Job 27. We'll take it by chapter. Romans 1, Psalm 146. I always used to get annoyed when Brother Knox would do that, like throw ten verses at it. Get this, get this, and get this, and get this. I can't get all that. I don't. You got to get one of those. Um, those uh, what do they have them? Um, you can mark. You got like five markers in the Bible at one time. Those you know bead things that they put together. <clears throat> what? One forty nine. Forty six. One forty six. Job twenty seven. Let me try it again. Job 27, Romans 1, Psalm 146. Let's just read the first six verses of Job, and then we'll go to, uh, and then we'll kind of intro our way in here, and we'll be in Romans next. But moreover, Job continued his parable and said, "Is God liveth, who hath, who hath taken away my judgment, and the Almighty who hath vexed my soul?" All the while my breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils, my lips shall not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. God forbid that I should justify you. Till I die, I will not remove mine integrity from me. My righteousness I hold fast, and will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me so long as I live. Those are big words from a man who's gone through more than any one of us have ever gone through. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we did a message called The Sin of Self-Righteousness. Um, yeah. It's actually it did pretty well on YouTube, but not to talk about that all that much. But um, you know, I'm thankful that a number of the, the messages that we put out there that have to do with the gospel and how we, you know, how we are to get saved, they get a lot of hits. And so praise the Lord for that. Pray about that. You never know who's read or listening and getting saved. So, but we did this message called "The Sin of Self Righteousness." Um, it's the world. That's the the approach to heaven and hell by the world is what do I do? How do I do it? Um, if you, listen, if you've witnessed for any amount of time, I'm assuming as a saved person that you've witnessed. Okay, if you've done so, you most assuredly have encountered people that either believe that they are good enough to earn heaven, or at the very least, not bad enough to have earned hell. And that's, I think, mostly where everyone lies. Well, I'm not that bad, right? Uh, this thinking is self-righteousness, and it is a sin that will send the least of sinners or the greatest of sinners to hell. This is the one that will send them there. When I uh, worked uh, in a factory, I remember a conversation that I had um, with, I've had lots of conversations in that factory, but I remember one stands out where I was just sharing the gospel. I was working one-on-one -on -one with somebody, and he already didn't like me. You know, they referred to me as Jeebus, I guess meant Jesus boy, which is a compliment. Um, but I had him one on one. I had captive audience. We had uh, were working down the aisle in the factory, and so uh, I, you know, began to witness to him. And I just, I just went, to, you know, Jesus. I mean, really, it was this simple. Jesus loved you enough to go through what he went through on that cross. He rose up out of the grave. He can be trusted. Man, just stop trusting in yourself. He looks at me, and in his response is, "You are so self-righteous." The world does not understand the meaning of self-righteous. In their minds, somehow they've got it completely turned upside down. A Christian, a born-again Christian, a Bible-believing, a Bible-defined Christian, uh, relies on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's how I get saved. I am not good. 
If it's on my merits, I'll be the first to admit I'm done. Uh, I'm in serious trouble. So I'm counting on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So I'm not, biblically, I'm not self-righteous, I'm Jesus righteous. But the world who says, well, I'm not that bad or I'm good enough, that isn't self-righteousness? To say, I'm a good person, that's self-righteous. How is it possible that people would be so obviously errant? Romans 1. We will pray before we start breaking down the text. I just want to lay this foundation. A shorter message tonight, I think, tonight, too. Uh, I've got to get there myself. Romans 1. This, by the way, all the book of Romans, but Romans chapter 1, you want to talk to someone who's self-righteous, you bring them to Romans 1. You bring them to Romans 1. Verses 18... Uh, what do we want to read down through 28? For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So the wrath of God is going to be revealed against all ungodliness. That's what it says. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. In who? Even the lost. For God hath showed it unto them. So how did God show them the truth? Listen, with, even without the word, they have a creation account and they have a conscience within them that speaks that there is a creator. And if they will acknowledge that there must be a creator and through the conscience that I must be accountable to him, then he'll bring, he'll bring the third revelation, which is the word of God. He'll bring that to somebody and he'll bring Christ to them. Three C's, Right? Uh, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, again, that creation's clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. There's America's problem. There's American Christian problem but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and are in colleges now as professors, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man, into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. And of course, the average educated man in America would say, well, I don't worship any of that. Uh, your, you, your mirror is one of those things. So it's not a four-footed creeping thing, it's a two-foot creep. <laughs> Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Yeah, sometimes God amens himself. When he says something really good, he just throws in an amen there. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, received in themselves the recompense of their error, which was meat. So you see, this, this, this whole chapter is all about homosexuality. Actually, it's about idolatry. Homosexuality is just a result of not wanting to retain God in their knowledge. And it's one of many other sins. By the way, if you read verses 29, 30, and 31, it's not just about homosexuality. Verse 28, Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. What does reprobate mean? What does probate mean? Probate is in good standing. Reprobate is it's a simple way of saying not good. 
Why does this world think contrary to God, according to Romans 1? Because they, in their heart, are contrary to God. They don't want to know Him. And when they don't like to retain God in their knowledge, He then, after time, turns them over to what they desire. He turns them over to their own logic, their own reasoning ability or inability usually, their own knowledge or lack thereof. And it is by nature then, that logic, that reasoning, that heart of man, that very nature is the complete opposite of anything God says. If God says it's high, man says it's low. If God says it's long, man says it's short. With no evidence to prove any of it. All the evidence to points towards what God said, but man says, no, it's the complete opposite. He is the mind of a liberal. Vile, according to Scripture. And for the kids who are all into superheroes, you know what that is? That's the equivalent. These men are the equivalent of Bizarro. The opposite of Superman in every way. They are the opposite of Jesus Christ. Go to Psalm 146. In case Romans 1 wasn't enough, Psalm 146, I ought to let you know that this is a judgment of God. The thought that you encounter on a day-to-day -day basis with that world, the stuff that you see on the news media, the craziness, and you're going, when is this going to change? What is going, this world's gone crazy. Yeah. God did that. It's Psalm 146 and verse 9. Well, I should say, God responded to what man did. Like Pharaoh who hardened his heart first and then God said, you want to harden your heart? No, I'm really going to harden it. And then just, you know, it's like man kind of dipping his toe in water and God says, you want that water? Kick you right in. Psalm 146 verse 9. The Lord preserveth the strangers, he relieveth the fatherless and widow, but the way of the wicked, what does he do? He turneth, God bless you, upside down. Why does when God says go long, they go short? They're upside down. Why is it when God says, if you're trusting in your righteousness, you're self-righteous, and they, and they go, you're trusting in Jesus, you're self-righteous. Why is it the complete opposite? God did that. He turned them upside down. Why did he do that? They don't like him. Listen, this world does not like the character of God. That's why they don't like to retain him in their knowledge. If he was like them, you know... Like that song, What If God Was One of Us, a 90s song? Just a slob like one of us? Yeah, that's how man wants God to be. But he's not a slob like you. He's holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. He's not anything like you. And you've got to give an account to him. And they don't like that. So they don't like God's character. Now, that's, this is all said by way of introduction. Our pal Job, a lot of typologies. Job is a type of Christ. Suffering. He's a type of Israel going through the tribulation, probably the greatest type, 42 chapters, 42 uh, uh, weeks of, or months of uh, great tribulation. He's a type of a repentant and saved man at the end of the book who finally comes to the end of himself and says, I abhor me. Does a lot of abhorring God's judgment through much of this book. He'll get to a place... You know, listen, enough brokenness, if you have that humility in you, God can work with you. So he's that type at the end of the book. But here, at this part of the book, at this point in the story, he is a type of a self-righteous man. We've already covered the sin of self-righteousness, have we not, a couple weeks ago. So what are we dealing with here tonight? Now, we read what he said in Job. The Bible says, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. 
1 Samuel 15.23, the Bible also says, Look not unto the stubbornness of this people, nor to their wickedness, nor to their sin. Deuteronomy 9 and verse 27. So what we're going to see Job do tonight here is indicative of the human race when confronted with the truth. Now you can either humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, which will lead to the salvation of your soul because you'll trust in the righteousness of Christ. Or, like most men will do when confronted with the truth, double down. Heels in the dirt. And the Lord will deal harshly with this sin in the day of judgment. We're just getting it. That's just the intro. It's not going to be long, really. It won't be a long message. Father, help us to see truth uh, out of the Word of God tonight. Uh, show us wondrous things out of thy law, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, verses 1 and 2 again. Moreover, Job continued his parable and said, As God liveth. So who's he swearing by? He's swearing by God. What did Jesus say we shouldn't swear by? Don't swear by anything, man. If you can't back it up, just don't. Right? Let your yea be yea and your nay nay. But as God liveth, who hath taken away my judgment, so let me just throw in this jab also against God, and the Almighty who hath vexed my soul. How about you? So if you were to now describe your Savior, your God, would he be, would the first thing out of your mouth be, he that vexes my soul? Maybe he that hath redeemed my soul, right? So I just referred to the self righteous uh, to se the self righteousness as preferring to double down on an error rather than repent and receive the truth. Verse one begins with the word "moreover." Do you see that in the text? It's it's not a word that Job speaks but a word that the Holy Ghost has inserted into the narrative, into the text, through Elihu, who would, who would be the human author. Of course, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, but the human author of Job. And the word moreover means in addition to or to increase. So the Holy Ghost is already letting us know before the words get out of Job's mouth that he is going to add sin to sin. He had already charged God with injustice. We've read that. I mean, we're 27 chapters in. Multiple times he charged God with not having the ability to judge fairly and properly. He is now increasing that. He is moreovering it. He's adding sin to sin. In fact, to the point of continuing to charge God with folly, as God liveth, so says Job, who hath taken away my judgment? He hasn't judged me properly. And hath vexed my soul. See, see a self-righteous person will blame God for his supposed inability to judge fairly before he will admit that maybe, just maybe, it is he, man, who is judging the matter unfairly. I don't see the end from the beginning. Would it not be wise to trust the judgment of the one who can? If one witness on the witness stand had the ability to read into the heart of the man who's being charged with murder and could look in there and go, guilty is sin. No matter how much the defense attorney posed his arguments, who would you rather trust? The one who can see what you can't see, what the other jurors can't see, and what the defense attorney is lying about. If the glove don't fit, you must have quit. Lord, help us. Justice is... They say justice is blind. It is. In America, justice is as blind as a bat. Romans 2. Go ahead and flip over there. Romans 2. Verses 13, 14, and 15. And I'm pulling, I'm pulling these verses out of a larger context. 
Paul is laying, well, the Holy Spirit through Paul is laying a foundation to get us to the fifth chapter about being saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And he's just getting everyone guilty over the first couple chapters. Um, and in the second one, of course, I mean, it, listen, if, if righteousness could have come by the law, it would have, according to Scripture. But it can't come by the law. Why? Because of the infirmity of my flesh. My flesh is going to sin. It's Adamic by nature. So I'm pulling this out of its larger context. But look at verses 13, 14, and 15. And 15 is where I'll get my point. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Again, not to get us to a place of saying, well, I've got to keep the law to be saved. He's laying a foundation. So, verse uh, 14. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, are a law unto themselves. Verse 15, and here's the point. Which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience, see, creator, first, first witness, chapter 1, conscience, second witness, chapter 2. Their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts... So here's what happens when man's conscience gets stirred by the, by the truth. He's going to do one of two things. The thoughts, the meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another. These are aspects that are irrefutable in verse 15. Two things about man. He is an accuser and he is an excuser. He is an accuser of others. He is an excuser of himself. And it could be the same sin. That's the point of the second chapter. How dare you sit there and go, well, you know, and he's in particular, well, we've got the law of Moses. Okay, great. You've got the law of Moses. They don't have the law of Moses. They have a conscience. You have the law of Moses and you break the law of Moses. They don't have the law of Moses. They have a conscience and break the law of Moses. So who are you to walk around accusing them of not being righteous because they don't have the law of Moses when you, who have the law of Moses, break the law of Moses? That's chapter 2 in a nutshell. It's just Paul, he, you know, the Holy Spirit wants to bring you around because he wants you to study to show yourself approved. He wants you to read it and you've got to get the larger body of work here. So... Even, I'm, listen, this is the truth. Even save people who happen to not be walking according to the Spirit, but according to the flesh, they do the same thing. Just be a pastor for a few years. You will hear every excuse under the sun. And you will hear every accusation under the sun. Typically towards you as the pastor. But then sometimes of others. And then when you have to present something to somebody, lovingly, kindly, pulling them aside, quietly, may I talk to you? Oh, you don't understand, Pastor. Okay, what don't I, know? What don't I understand? What is, it I'm, what is it I'm not getting? And then out come the excuses. Why? Because the church is satanic. Hey, listen, I didn't say saved. If you're part of the church, you're saved. I say, well, how can the church be satanic? How could Peter speak for Satan? And Jesus have to say, get thee behind me, Satan. If we're not living this, and we're a mouthpiece, and living contrary to this, we are speaking for Satan. We're a living, breathing, walking, talking testimony of the power of Satan in our lives. Who is Satan by nature? He is the what of the brethren? He's the accuser. Now it won't take me very long to assume based on Romans chapter 2 and the fact that he's an accuser and that he is the father of all the children of pride that if he's the accuser, that he's probably also a self-excuser. God's not fair. Yea, hath God said. Yea, does God have judgment. Ye shall not surely die. 
So Job is excusing himself and he's accusing God. So who's he acting like? That's the nature of fallen, unrepentant, proud, and stubborn man. Verses 3 and 4. Nice pick-me-up for Wednesday. It's your best life now right here. Verses 3 and 4. All the while my breath is in me and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils, my lips shall not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. What's he saying? I'm good. Really, I swear. While I live and speak, there ain't even a wicked word coming out of my mouth. Not ever. Not once. And 1 John 1.8 would say, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. He's deceived himself. To say that you're a good person when the Bible says you're a sinner, it makes you a liar. And ready? A liar? Well, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. Revelation 21 and verse 8. See, it's just a white lie. It doesn't say whether white or black lies. It just says all liars. So you either better be covered by the blood of Jesus Christ or you're in that category. Because I don't know anyone, not a soul other than Jesus that ain't lied. Listen, we understand that Job's plight was, it was unprovoked. I mean, God provoked it with a conversation with Satan. But what I mean by that is he didn't do anything in particular to have had life turn on him the way it had. So it wasn't sin in Job's life that the Lord desired or needed to address. It was the opposite thinking of Job that God needed to address. I'm so good that I should be exempt from bad things ever happening in my life. And this is why so many people have a hard time with God. Because life, let's be honest, life is filled with heartache. Sick bed comes for all. Tears roll down everyone's cheek at some point in time in their life. Loss tears through the hearts of every single... Someone has suffered a loss. Someone has. And death comes for all. And to unregenerate man, this then is proof that God is not just. Why? Why? Because, as I mentioned, I'm either too good for that to happen to me, or I'm not so bad that that should happen to me. It's not fair. That's how man thinks. I don't like the way God assesses things. But the lesson from God is, listen, Job, listen, <laughs> mankind, you are alive. And if alive then life will happen. Be prepared to live life. There's not a man on earth that deserves to be exempt from the negative things of this life. Jesus, who was, is, ever shall be, as I mentioned earlier, holy, harmless, and separate from sinners, suffered in this life. So who are you? Who am I? Why am I exempt? Honestly, am I really that good? Man, I'd knock someone down the stairs for the right bargain at Walmart, right? I got hip checked once by an old lady over towels. True story. There's a whole rack of them. I have, I'm a man. I have no interest in towels. Other than when my hands are wet and I want to... I, but I have no interest in purchasing towels. I was just walking and man, oh man, she wanted those towels. And I was standing in front of them. Verses 5 and 6. We'll go home. God forbid that I should justify you. 
Till I die, I will not remove mine integrity from me. He's talking to his friends, right? I am not justifying you. My righteousness I hold fast. Ooh. I will not let it go. I w- See that word? It's not I cannot. I will. I will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me so long as I live. So here's the summation of these last couple verses for tonight. Job's saying to his buddies and ultimately to God, I'm right, you're wrong, and you can't convince me otherwise. God himself can't convince me otherwise. God himself could come down here, and when he does, I got some words for him. Well, he will, and he'll have no words. <laughs> That's, I mean, we've talked about that lots of times in our study of Job. That's man. Oh, I'll tell you what, if, this, if God exists, I can't wait to ask him some questions. You stand in his presence, you ain't got nothing to say. You're scared out of your mind. So, that's not just self-righteousness, folks. These verses 5 and 6, that's the stubbornness of doubling down on self-righteousness. Which, according to Scripture, puts you on par with being a witch. I'm righteous, verse 6, and I will not let it go. You see that in the clause? My heart shall not reproach me so long as I live. The word reproach expresses disapproval or contempt. So Job is saying, I will not disapprove of myself so long as I live. That's something. That's real self-righteousness, folks. Most of us are willing to admit, hey man, I've screwed up a little here and there. But he said, man, I will never disapprove of myself. (laughs) And that, my friends, is unrepentant man. It's not sin from which he needs to repent. He can't. I've talked about this. You can't repent from sin. In your flesh, you can't. That's why Jesus went to the cross. You've got to repent of your self-love your self-worship, or your idolatry. Anything that is opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ, repent and believe the gospel. Don't double down on self-righteousness by adding stubbornness to it. You get to that place in your heart, I'm telling you by the authority of the Word of God in Romans chapter 1, God will turn you over to it. Now, he sees something in Job because he knows the end from the beginning and he knows that Job will have a a place of repentance in him. But you don't want to be this guy. Even as a church member, let's, let's step outside of the bounds of salvation and let's step into the bounds of sanctification. You don't want to be that guy that says... That's as far as I'm going for God. Sure, preacher comes along. You sure you don't want to take one more step? Come on, come on, saints. Nope. You don't want to be that guy. You don't want to be that girl. You don't want God to turn you over to your stubbornness. Even as a saved person. To go back to the matter of salvation and we'll close. The biggest reason, as I see it anyhow, that man is not willing to repent and believe the gospel is because he's got to admit he's wrong. And that is the biggest issue man has. You can say a lot of things about me, just don't ever tell me I'm incorrect. Those are fighting words to most people. And the Lord is looking for broken and contrite, broken hearts, contrite spirits. That's what he's looking for. And he will respond graciously to that. He will respond stubbornly to stubbornness. 
whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also... All right, Father, thank you uh, for time in your word. I know that um, most of it, I guess, as far as salvation is concerned, doesn't really pertain to the saints here tonight. Um, just discussing human nature as a whole. Uh, maybe somebody watching through YouTube, maybe that's them. Maybe they're not saved. Maybe they're doubling down on thinking they're good enough to earn heaven. Lord, I pray that by your Spirit you would convince them that they're not. But for the saints here tonight, myself included, Lord, that we wouldn't be so stubborn as to draw lines in the sand and to say that we're not going any further than where we are right here, right now. Lord, I pray that our hearts would, that they would be malleable, that they would be placable. And, uh, Lord, that um, we'd be a lump of clay that's soft and willing to be molded and molded by the potter and fit for the master's use. And I pray it all now in Jesus' name. 